uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm sharing uh, this, my screen. Um, okay, I assume uh, uh, everybody sees my slides here. Okay. Uh, and uh, everybody sees my mouse moving uh, in. Is it the case? Okay, cool. Okay, so this is the, uh, let me, is an introduction. Uh, I just started to uh, a quick introduction to this course. I take this course every two years so that uh, uh, every PhD student can attend uh, in his or her career. Okay, so the aim of this course is to uh, give an introduction to substantially two technologies, SAT and SMT. Um, okay. So, okay, uh, so proposition satisfiability, most known as a SAT and satisfiability model theories, uh, SMT, are two very important technologies in, in many, uh, many application domains. Uh, um, uh, this raises both from a theor purely theoretical and a very uh, application oriented uh, uh, interest. So SAT is uh, a huge th theoretical interest, uh, uh, because it's the NP-complete problem and uh, uh, also much uh, interest from uh, lots of uh, theoretical, but also as a huge amount of applications because the SAT engines are part of uh, uh, many, many devices uh, uh, for solving uh, NP hard problems in general. Um, so the, and, uh, both SAT and SME solvers uh, uh, are very, very much used as backend engine in a variety of uh, applications. So this course provides an introduction to SAT and, and to SMT. Uh, well, there are many fields on interest you may touch to about this course, including automatic reasoning, algorithm, combinatorics, uh, AI, of course, uh, bioinformatics, uh, constraint programming, electronics, uh, knowledge representation, formal verification software and hardware, optimization, security, cryptanalysis, and many others. So many people involved uh, on many such domains uh, need knowing about SAT and to many extent also to SMT. Okay, so this course will take uh, 20 hours, uh, divided in, in uh, 10 classes to um, uh, two hour classes each, uh, in, of course in English. Uh, well, the main target is PhD student of our ICT school, but it's open to whoever may be interested, in particular, uh, first and second year MS students in computer science. And this is very neatly divided into two parts, which coarsely may take uh, half course each, coarsely speaking, may be the case that one takes four and the other takes six or vice versa, but uh, more or less uh, we'll consider five classes each. One is to SAT and the other to SMT, of course. Uh, okay, I would like, uh, uh, so I would expect you to have some background in logic. I will start giving a very brief uh, uh, crash course in um, Boolean logic, but it will be very, very fast. Uh, in order, and this is done in order to be sure that you know the, the very basic components which are needed in the course. And also I expect you to have a basic knowledge of algorithms and data structures. So if I mention a stack or, or, a, uh, uh, um, or a queue or a tree, I, I, I expect you know what I'm speaking about. Oh, the exam, this is a sort of test that we'll do uh, some written test that you have to submit to, uh, to send me. So I give you some questions and then, then you have uh, to write down in a file and then and then you'll, uh, uh, you'll uh, uh, send me and I will correct. In, uh, this is more or less two hours. Okay, so material. So some of you ask me for material. Well, then there's a huge, a huge amount of materials in SAT and SMT. Uh, well, of course, uh, my slides. Uh, okay, you, you may find all the slides I'm presenting in this website, which is easy to reach from my personal website. So you don't need to taking uh, note of that because you can easily reach it from my personal website. I will uh, upload also the recording of those uh, classes. Um, 
and uh, also I um, well I expect you to take notes uh, of everything you don't know there are also some survey papers for SAT well the main reference is the handbook of satisfiability well this is a big book uh, well actually I is this this one but I, I'm not expecting you to buy it but you can uh, uh, there are, you can find it uh, on, online, so the chapters of interest. Also, there is an interesting uh, survey paper, uh, very basic, by Lintal Zhang and Sharad Malik, which you can find it, the Cast for Efficient Boolean Certificate Solvers, which takes uh, most uh, of uh, the interesting parts of CDCR such solvers. And then there are survey papers, uh, and then there are these SMT, well, uh, I've written uh, long ago um, a very, very long uh, uh, survey paper, something like 80 pages, uh, on uh, satisfiability model theories. Uh, also, there is, uh, uh, which you can uh, get from uh, my website. Also, there is uh, um, another long paper uh, co-authored by me and the other two people, uh, three people, which is the chapter of the satisfiability model theories in the handbook of satisfiability which again, uh, you can find online or also from my web page. And also there's another paper, uh, mostly devoted to applications that's uh, uh, by Leonardo de Moura and Nikolai Bjorner, uh, Satisfiability Model Theories, Introduction and Applications on, from Communication of the ACM. And there are many, many papers. So if you are interested in a specific topic, I can uh, just send me an email. I can uh, suggest you references uh, for, for that. Also, we see that uh, all of the paper I will have uh, I will put some references, bib references, with a number, okay, in square brackets. And at the end of the slides, there is a list of references uh, that you can uh, uh, look at. Okay, so classes are, uh, unless there will be any ch change, uh, there will be on Monday, Friday from uh, 9, uh, 11. And we have already agreed that uh, um, I will, uh, we start at 9.15. Um, and the summer where we'll uh, uh, we'll decide when to do. I, I will ask you to, I uh, really, really asking you to make the exam only one. So we'll uh, agree on a day, but I wish everybody doesn't a day so that I, I didn't want to make many instances of that. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, uh, more or less it. Are there any questions? Ah, uh, by the way, uh, be f feel free to interrupt me in uh, whatever moment uh, you uh, you may want to. Okay, so in the sense, re well, you don't have a raise hand, so I don't look at the raise hand uh, device uh, of uh, uh, of uh, the uh, Zoom, but uh, just uh, switch on your mic and uh, ask me. Okay. Okay, so um, let's uh, start. Uh, uh, okay, let me ch just check one minute if anybody has joined in. Uh, so, okay, there is one other pair. Uh, Leonardo, custode, just one second. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, that's another. Okay, let me. Okay, uh, nobody, nobody else uh, entered. Uh, you still can me hear me well, right? Yep. Okay, cool. Now let's. Okay, I share again the the second group of slides. Okay. Oh. Uh, but there, can you read well? Do you want me to make, well, I can make them bigger, okay? Okay, so the, the first part of the course will be, uh, <coughs> will be uh, to devoted to SAT. Uh, it may be the case that during the course, I decide to add a few things, to modify some few things uh, or to adapt uh, a new user. So please take a look to the last update on the slides. So just uh, you see the report and if you see a new version, you can uh, uh, download it uh, uh, on um, on the fly. I, I will tell you, however, if I have made any significant uh, improvements. Uh, 
Okay. So, okay, so let me start speaking of some basics on SAT, uh, on, on the problem of SAT. Okay. Okay, so uh, just a notation and a definition. So I expect you all know what a Boolean formula, but just introduced to the notation. Um, these symbols are used for both indifferent for the two and false uh, uh, constants and values. A proposition of four, well, you have a propositional atoms or Boolean variables or propositions or, or uh, Boolean atoms, however you want to call them. So they are called in different ways depending on the community you are speaking about. And even within the sub community, somebody calls it a different way. And uh, in general, this is uh, uh, every formula is a Boolean combination of a propositional atom. So every formula you can build. Uh, uh, using the uh, negation. This is the symbol for negation. This is the symbol for and. This is the symbol for or. This is uh, in the symbol for right implication, left implication, if and only if, okay? So by implication, okay? So all the, so all the formula which you can build from the true-false constants and uh, a proposition atom enclosed under the Boolean connectors, okay? Uh, we generally call atoms of five the set of atoms occurring in phi, considering each uh, only once, of course. Okay. Uh, notation we call a literal, a propositional atom, which we call positive literal, or its negation, not AI, so negative literal. Um, as, a as a notation, uh, if L is a, neg a negative literal, by the negation of L, we don't mean uh, not not AI, but we we mean uh, right we mean implicit AI. So we implicitly assume we drop the double negation in front of a Boolean atom. Okay. Okay. So if L is not AI, by not L we mean AI, not 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 AI. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, the important definition is a close. Any disjunction of literals like a one or not a two or a three, blah, 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 is a close. We call a cube, so the dual of, um, of a close, any conjunction of literals. So a one and not a two and a three and blah, blah. Okay, I assume everybody knows the truth tables of, uh, of the meaning of the standard Boolean operators. So and negation toggles the truth value and uh, is true or only when both are true, or is true only when both, so all, uh, or is false only when uh, um, both are false, implication uh, is false only when the uh, antecedent is true and the, uh, um, the, the premise, is the implicant uh, is, uh, uh, is false. Left implication is just uh, the reverse direction of, uh, of right implication. And if and only if, uh, say, uh, is true only when they have the, same, the two elements have the, have the same value. Okay. Uh, a few remarks. Just recall that and and or and if and only ifs are commutative, so uh, they don't depend on the order that we are uh, using, and that and and or are associative. Uh, by this uh, uh, mean that we'll uh, use uh, uh, when we use and and or, we may use them as an inner. Without uh, uh, <laughs> we exploit the associativity, we might write tuples of uh, ends and endors in this form. Okay. Uh, okay, there are a few uh, syntactic properties of Boolean operators which I expect you to know. Well, double negation is a little, of course. Uh, remember that is the duality of and and or. So the uh, the or uh, um, the negation of the or is the end of the negation. The negation of the end is the or of the negations. So this is, uh, of course, vice versa. Another fact, important fact, is that uh, implication can be is equivalent uh, to the negation of the uh, implicant uh, um, or the implicate. And of course, the negation is the implicant and the negation of the implicate, of course. Left implication, just the reverse. If and only if uh, can be written, seen as two, two distinct uh, implications. So is the end of uh, left implication and right implication. And uh, 
its negation is can be seen as also, which is also equivalent to the, what's called the XOR. The, uh, actually, OR is either the, the OR of the two and the OR of the negate and the order of the negations. Sorry if I say something which is absolutely obvious to you, but I, I really need you to know this before going ahead. Um, something important is that also that uh, uh, noticing that and the implica or implication, left implication by implication can be written in terms of, uh, of and and negations. So we need only not an and uh, to represent Boolean formulas, and you can consider all the other operations as a syntactical sugar for, for their respective meanings. So sometimes we give, we give a definition for only for and and not, and uh, giving implicit that the others can, the definition of the others can be left derived from the definition of uh, implication or blah, blah, blah. Again, I apologize. Uh, if for most of you, uh, this is absolutely, what I'm saying is absolutely obvious, but uh, I, I just need you to know that. Okay, so uh, um, something important that you, you always have to remember. Okay, in, when you have to implement a device which reason with logic, um, formulas can be, you have to keep, Pay attention that the form can be represented as, as a tree or as a direct um, <coughs> um, direct aesthetic graph. Sorry, um, dagger uh, and sometimes the dagger. Well, do anybody know what what a dag? So, is there anybody who doesn't know what a dag is? Direct aesthetic graph. Okay. Uh, it's very important. Uh, this is very important because uh, a dagger representation of a form can be up to exponentially smaller. So can avoid exponential blow up in size of formula. A typical example is an, when you have if and leaves. So suppose you have a chain of four if and leaves, like this very simple one. Okay, and you want to expand them uh, as implications, right? So every if and leaf can be expanded as uh, the the end of a, of a left or right implication, or if you can revert the order. But if you expand them into implications and go ahead, then uh, the formula blows up exponentially, right? So if you have a chain of n, uh, n by implications here, and you expand as, as every time you expand it by implication, you duplicate everything, and this expands exponentially. However, you may notice that many of these implications are shared. So for instance, this is, is the same as this, uh, this is the same as this, and so on and so forth, right? So imagine that you, you have many of them and you expand them. You have uh, an exponentially big formula. However, if you represent this as a DAG, okay, so you share the subnodes, okay? This exponentially blow up uh, is, um, uh, is avoided by just uh, sharing the nodes. What every typical device uh, reasoning with the uh, logic uh, use a DAG representation in, uh, inside so that they represent every instance of any super formula only once, okay? There are algorithms to, to handle that. Okay, so this is very important to remember. And probably is something that uh, uh, many logic courses do not teach you. Okay, now let's speak about semantics. Um, okay, well, a total truth assignment is, is a map which uh, uh, <coughs> assigns a truth value to every atom in, in a formula. Okay, a partial truth assignment is uh, uh, an assignment which, which assigns only some of them. Okay, this is very important in, uh, in logical reason because sometimes you don't need assigning all variables to, to all, um, all variables to a formula. Uh, just as a, a notational remark, uh, um, there are many distinct ways uh, by which you can represent the truth assignment. So, well, you can represent this as a function, say, okay, atom A1, A1 is assigned to true, atom is true is assigned to false, blah, blah, but this is um, inconvenient very often. 
is most often uh, useful to represent a truth assignment as a set of literals, like for instance, uh, A1, not A2, with the intended meaning that positive literals like this means that the variable is assigned to true, and negative literals like that means that uh, the atom is assigned to false. Okay. But also, also sometimes the same can be represented as a conjunction or a cube, right? So as a, the end of a true form here, yeah? the end of, of, of the literals corresponding. This is very convenient because this is also a formula. And interestingly, this is, the only, this is done without a loss of generality because the only truth assignment which satisfies this formula is, is this truth assignment here, right? So this is, so this is, this is a one-to-one -one correspondent by, by the two concepts. So we can do that without a loss of generality. Uh, okay, I hope you everybody knows the semantics uh, of uh, uh, Boolean operators, but just to recall it very quickly, we said that the total truth assignment, not that this definition relies on the to to total truth assignment, satisfies a formula, uh, so written in this form, so with this symbol here, uh, if uh, uh, by this recursive definition, well, if the formula is an atom, if the, the truth assignment, the, the assignment uh, makes the atom true. <laughs> the truth assignment satisfies the negation if it does not satisfy the negation. Notice that this rule holds only for total truth assignments, okay? Does not hold for partial ones. <coughs> okay. Um, well, <coughs> the truth assignment satisfies the end if it satisfies both the elements <clears throat> and satisfy the, the or if uh, it satisfies either or at least one of the elements, okay? It satisfies an implication if, uh, if it satisfies the, the, uh, the implicant, then uh, it also satisfies the implicate. And it satisfies the by implication if either satisfies both elements or if it doesn't satisfy them, it satisfies neither. Okay, here is something a little bit slightly more controversial <coughs> because not all authors accept this exactly this definition. Okay, so this is a, a simplified version of them. So what can we say about the partial truth assignment satisfying a phi? Well, one um, most people, most authors say simply say that uh, uh, mu satisfies phi if and only if it makes phi evaluated true. Okay, so if so, a partial, for instance, a partial assignment A1, so which assigned A1 to true, is enough to conclude to make A1 or A2 true. Okay, so sometimes we use, um, well, the um, okay, as a, an important consequence of this fact um, is that uh, if uh, a partial assignment satisfies phi then all these total extensions satisfy phi, okay? So in fact, uh, both A1, A2 uh, satisfy phi and A1 and not A2 satisfy phi, okay? Um, why I say this is slightly controversial because some author use this as a definition of uh, partial science satisfiability. And when a form is in conjunctive normal form, uh, these two concepts are substantially equivalent. Uh, however, this is a little stronger than that when you have a non-CNF form, yeah, but I, I don't want to enter in this discussion. Okay, if you are interested in this, uh, this is very picky discussion, uh, I, I can point you to, to some discussion. Okay, so let's accept this as a definition of partial assignment satisfiability. Okay. Uh, okay, phi is satisfiable if and only if uh, uh, we say that form is satisfiable if and only if uh, there exists some uh, truth assignment which satisfies it. We say that, uh, well, let's say total truth assignment because, um, of course, if it exists in a partial, there also exists a total one. We say that formula in phi one entails a formula phi two. Um, if and only if uh, all truth assignment which satisfy uh, phi one, they also satisfy the phi two. And we said that the formula is valid, uh, written in this form, if uh, 
all the total fruit assignment uh, satisfy phi. Okay. There is a well known property who says that phi is valid if and only if uh, uh, not phi is an unsatisfiable. So very often, well, most often, we when we want to find that if some property is valid, we actually prove that uh, phi is not satisfiable. Okay. Uh, also, there are some uh, other definitions, uh, and uh, here again, there is a, a slight distinction that may be you may may be new for you. So, okay, well, phi one and phi two are said to be equivalent if uh, when uh, a formula so if uh, every truth they are satisfied by the same truth assignment okay okay here is something maybe new for you we say the two formula are equi equisatisfiable or equivalently satisfiable if and only if if exists a, a truth assignment satisfying phi one if and only if exists a, a truth assignment phi two satisfying phi two. Notice that this is. Uh, I have a question to you. Do everybody know this distinction? Yes. So have you heard about this distinction before? Everybody. So is there anybody who has never seen this distinction before? Me, probably. Who? who sorry. Who is speaking? Uh, Manfredi. Okay, good. Okay, so let me let me explain this the, the difference because this is slight difference, but this is important in our context. And typically, it is not something that the courses of logic address. Okay, because so equivalence is a stronger notion than equisatisfiable. Why? Because this says that phi one and phi two are satisfied by the very same assignment. Okay. Substantially, phi one and phi two here are just different ways of expressing the same formula. Okay, here say exist phi one exist uh, so phi one is satisfied by if and only if the other is satisfied. But there is nothing says that the 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 two assignments satisfying then are the um, some way related. Okay, okay. The same. So okay. this does not say that the, the, the assignment satisfying one. Is the same of this, is the same assignment satisfied the other, okay? Okay. Okay. So, so, so the, the relation between the two, uh, phi one and phi two, is important in some ways in the future. Yeah, it's very very important here because okay. so the point here is that is say that phi one, uh, if phi one, if you know, if somebody tells you in advance that phi one and phi two are equisatisfiable. You know that if one is satisfiable, the other is satisfiable. If the other is one is unsatisfiable, the other is unsatisfiable. Okay. 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 But they are not necessarily satisfied by the same truth assignment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I show you an, an example here. So these two formula here, a one or a two, and uh, a one or not a three, and a three or a two, are equisatisfiable, but they are not equivalent. Okay, <coughs> so, so, um, so for instance, they are not equivalent because of this truth assignment here, not a one, a two, a three, is, uh, is satisfies uh, the former, but it does not satisfy the, the latter. Okay, because this makes this false, this is false, so if this one is false, so all, all the form is false. Okay, you see this? Yeah, yeah. Also, they are satisfiable. Well, but of course, they are both satisfiable, right? So, for instance, uh, you assign a one, a, a one to true, and a a two to true, and a three to true. This is satisfiable. Okay, are we there? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. So, why is this of interest? Yes. Yes, please, Chun. Uh, sorry, I want to ask uh, if phi one and phi two they are both unsatisfiable can we say that uh, they are equivalent yes. by your definition yes okay thanks yes the point is okay so why is this of interest because there are typically 
uh, formula transformations which uh, guarantee equisatisfiability. So there are transformations, say, that uh, um, which guarantee that uh, the output is equivalently satisfiable with respect to the input. So I take a formula phi one, I apply some transformation, equisatisfiability per service transformation, and uh, this returns a formula which is guaranteed to be equi equivalently satisfiable. Okay. Okay, so this my guess is that, uh, excuse me, so sorry, if I may, if I may, my guess is that this becomes useful, especially when we want to prove uh, that some formula is unsatisfiable, because, okay. well, or if you want to prove that something is satisfiable, but one don't really care about the actual truth assignment that, yeah, um, okay, yes. In fact, uh, we'll see that. But of course, but after no, I, the, the point is the following. Okay, uh, you got very near to the point. Okay, so in general, yes. Also, typically, um, those transformations tell you some information on how to build back uh, a truth assignment for the former, from a truth assignment or the others. The key point uh, is that they are not maintaining that they, they are not maintaining the same truth assignment. Okay, but typically, the, um, at least the transformation of interest that we have uh, are able to tell you a way to build a truth assignment from the former given truth assignment satisfying the latter. This is what happens in practice. The, the important factor is that those transformations are not uh, validity preserving. Okay, so in general, a validity preserving is also satisfiability preserving, of course, but not vice versa. So this allows, so when you are checking satisfiability, you may have transformations, we see some, which um, can do simplifications or rewrite, rewriting the form in, in a more convenient way, which are satisfiability preserving. So if you are checking satisfiability, checking the, the, uh, checking the satisfiability of the, of the second one, of the latter correspond to check the satisfiability of the former. But we'll see some examples, well, some cases of this. Okay? Do I clarify this? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so when we have a manipulation, you see manipulation of the formula, there are two kinds of manipulation of formula. One is validity preserving, and the one is just uh, rewrite the formula into an, equi an uh, equivalent one. Another is simply satisfy, a weaker one is satisfiability preserving. So it guarantees you that if, if one is satisfiable, the other is satisfiable and vice versa, okay? And uh, well, there is another implicit factor that most of those transformations also tell you some, a way of uh, building a truth assignment satisfying the former from a truth assignment satisfying the latter. Okay, is this clear now? Yeah. Okay. My question is, have you ever seen this before? Because uh, typically this is not the kind of thing that uh, is explained uh, in, in logic courses. Well, apart from those who have attended my, my form methods course, of course, but which I tell, but, but okay. So often this, I, I'm telling this because this is maybe a non-obvious thing for even for people who have attended a logic course. Okay, let me go ahead. Okay, the complexity of SAT, uh, well, there are up to two to n to assign candidate to the assignments to, to be checked. And the problem of the size satisfiability of, um, of proposition form is NP complete. Actually, is the NP complete problem is the, by Cook. It was proved by Cook. Uh, so it was the problem which uh, made uh, Cook uh, introduce the notion of NP completeness. Okay. So the, why is this important? Because the most important logical problems like validity, inference, uh, entailment, uh, equivalence, can be straightforward reduced to satisfiability and thus uh, are NP complete or NP complete depending whether they are aiming at unsatisfiability or satisfiability. So substantial, there exists no worst case polynomial algorithm. Okay, here again, instead, there is an, an important definition, which I'm not sure that most logical courses they give, which is the notion of polarity of a form, of a sub formula within a formula. Substantially, well, substantially, the polarity is the number of nested negations modulo two, okay, which means uh, this is a recursive definition. So 
every, to every subformula occurring in a formula, you can give a polarity, meaning it can be positive occurrence, negative occurrence, or can it be both. And this is defined as follows. So phi occurs positively in itself. If not phi occurs positively in, uh, in uh, if not phi one occurs positively in phi, then phi one occurs negative in phi and vice versa. So substantial means the negation toggles the polarity, inverts the polarity. Okay, that's not surprising, right? If uh, you have uh, a phi and phi two or phi one or phi two, and this occurs positively in phi, then these uh, components occur positively uh, in, uh, in phi or vice versa, meaning and and or do not change the polarity of the components, okay? Uh, if phi 1 implies phi 2 occur positively in phi, then phi 1 occurs negatively and uh, phi 2 occur positively and vice versa. Well, why is this the case? Well, remember that phi 1 implies phi 2 is the same as not phi 1 or phi 2. Okay, which from which uh, you, you entail this factor as a consequence of the, of the first two bullets. Okay. By implication, be careful, beware of by implication when we deal with the polarity. Because if phi 1, phi 2 occurs in phi, no matter whether positively or negatively, all its components occur both positively and negatively. So, substantially, if uh, your formula occurs under the scope of, of a by implication, this means that it automatically has double polarity. Okay, the reason is that uh, you can think to do by implication at the end of two implications in one direction or the others, right? So this means that phi one, phi one if and only phi two is a shortcut for phi one implies phi two and uh, phi two implies phi one. Okay, so you can see that in both cases, both occur either as positive or both positive and negative. Okay. Beware of my implication when you think in terms of polarity. Okay. Okay. Um, is anybody of you who works uh, in uh, knowledge representation, description logics, uh, and all this sort of stuff? No. Nobody from the group of Chiara Ghidini, Luciano Serafini, or anybody? Okay, so sometimes, uh, uh, okay, then, okay, one important form uh, of, uh, uh, there are many ways, distinct ways of uh, encoding a formula. Um, one is negative normal forms, which is uh, useful in some context, in particular knowledge, knowledge representation and uh, AI. And um, a formula is a negative normal form, uh, it's given only in terms of ends or and literals, meaning you don't have implication, you don't have by implications, and all negations are in front of the Boolean atoms. Okay, uh, you can easily encode everything into negative normal form, but just by substituting the, the implication, the if and only if implication by the encoding and the non encoding, and then I push down a uh, negation recursively. So applying recursively the obvious rules that not the negation of an end is the or of the negations, the negation of the or is the end of the negation and doubly neg double negations are removed. So if you apply recursively from top to top down the, uh, uh, those rules, you have a form in negative normal form, okay? Well, be careful of, by, again, beware of by implications. If you do things properly, so if you use a dagger representation, then the result of the reduction is linear in size. Why? Because you share. So the, the trick is handily correcting the, the by implication expansion. Okay. Instead, okay, and this format is equivalent validity per certain or equivalent per certain in the sense that this is just a syntactical manipulation. Of the formula. So the original formula is logically equivalent to the 
to the um, resulting the output formula of this process. Just to give you an example, again, if you have this formula, you wanted to reduce it to negative number form, okay? So what we can, uh, sorry, just two seconds, I'm trying to keep, keep track of uh, our time. Uh, if we have uh, a one if and only if a two and a three if and only if a four, if you remember, we can expand this in this way. We have already seen this. And then uh, we can uh, just rewrite the implications as an or, okay? And then we can push inside negation. So th this is, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, the, uh, an or here, which is uh, uh, with an, sorry, we have an, an a negation here, which you can push inside, okay? So we have um, an OR here, and this AND here is a negated AND, which is rewritten as an OR of the negations, but the OR, uh, but then this negation of the OR becomes an OR of a negation, and so on and so forth, right? For instance, here, uh, we had uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this was negated and again, uh, so the negation of the or was transforming in the, is a, an end of the negation and so on. So everything here, uh, there were end, end, negation of ends which became uh, um, or of the negations and the negation of ors which became end of negations, okay? At the end of the day, you see that all uh, this is an alternation of ends and or where everything, uh, uh, all the negation are in front of the A's. Again, this is exponentially big. Uh, so if we had a chain of if implication, this would blow up in size, but uh, we can. So this is the full expansion if we use a tree, but if you use a, um, a, a DAG, we have uh, a shared, uh, we share the, uh, the nodes and we have a linear encoding. Why uh, we have a lead, the reason is because we share two formulas. Notice that sometimes negative normal form uh, is not so convenient from the, um, from uh, uh, the point of um, the size because uh, the same formula which occurs both positively and negatively is encoding to different formula. One for its positive version and one for its negative version. Okay, so for instance, uh, let me say uh, this uh, formula here occurs uh, twice, okay? One with the positive and the other with the negative polarity. And see that this is the positive one at the end ends up being a one and not a two. Uh, well, sorry, where is it? Uh, one, two, one, two. Oh, no, this is uh, again with the double polar. Um, no, wrong example, sorry. Um, okay, so there are some formula which occur uh, both positively and negatively. And they, they are encoded into two different nodes, one with the negation up front, the other without the negation up front. And the one with the negation up front is, is itself transformed. So they occur as different nodes in the form. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, just to, to say that there are many different representation of non CNF formula, which are, um, the, depending on the, the kind of uh, problems that uh, we are encoding. And um, the idea is to try to um, maximize as much as possible the sharing of a sub formula. So there are techniques uh, which are very popular like end inverted graphs, uh, reduced Boolean circuits, uh, Boolean instruction diagrams. So there are a lot of equivalent uh, versions. One, for instance, one is, uh, uh, um, Boolean expression diagrams, uh, which are substantially uh, use only and if and only ifs and not. And uh, negations are uh, written on arcs. Okay, so for instance, uh, uh, 
and you share uh, all uh, these components of formula. So for instance, you can build very compact representations. Another one, a very popular one is n diverted graphs. So formula which are represented as, only as n's and negations. And negation is written as in the, in the arcs, so as dot on the graph uh, on the arc. And this is, and the goal is to maximize the, the sharing of some formula to dagify as much as possible the formula, so to say. We are not going to discuss this uh, uh, in deep, uh, uh, but just know that uh, that uh, this is uh, something that we use and I can point you to some uh, references if you are interested. Okay, I think it's time to have uh, the first break. Okay, and uh, so we interrupt uh, the uh, the, uh, the class and we get, get back to you in, let's say, 15 minutes from now, okay? Play again, uh, again, we share the screen again and restart, okay? Everybody connected? Uh, just one uh, um, remark about uh, a negative normal form. Uh, uh, I got the wrong example before, so but uh, here I have uh, the right one. So consider this uh, uh, this implication here. We have two instances of this implication here. One which occurs positively because it's an antecedent of an implication, and one negatively because it is a consequence of in, of, uh, of an implication. You see that at the end of the process, these are encoding into two different formulae. Okay? One positive and one negative one. This is negative because this occurred as an antecedent. In fact, uh, this is negated, you see? This is ne so this is a positive one. In fact, this, at the end, is converted into not a one or a two. This is a negative one because uh, it occurs as an antecedent, okay? And at the end, it, uh, it's encoded as not A1 or A2, which is A1 and not A2, okay? This is exactly what I meant by this node here. Sorry if uh, I, I got uh, the example wrong before, okay? I couldn't find the, the right example here. Okay, now we get to the point, the very, very important point in SAT, which is a, a conjunctive normal forms. So we said that the formula phi is in conjunctive normal form if it's written as conjunction of disjunctions of lita, that is a conjunction of clauses, okay? Um, and um, okay, the, so the, each disjunction is called a clause. Why is this, is this important? Because uh, uh, you don't have a complicated recursive structure of the formula, but then just you have a very, very basic simple structure. So you, you can handle as a list of lists of literals, okay? And you, you can organize a fixed structure of the formula, so two in two levels, okay? So if you are able to rewrite the form, the input formula in this form, then you don't need any complicated uh, reasoning on the recursive structure of the formula, okay? So that's why I would say 90, 99% of, well, 90% of automatic reasoning devices both in Boolean logic and others, reasoning in conjunctive normal form, require conjunctive normal form. Why is this the case? Okay, um, the key point is that every formula can be reduced into conjunctive normal form. And if we have two completely different possible approaches to convert into normal form, the first one is the one which you can find in, uh, in books of logic, which is uh, the, um, an equivalent, um, equivalent for serving uh, one, which is, uh, is based substantially on the Morgan rules. Well, you can or you cannot convert it into negative normal form. This is not, in, so this first step is not in the necessary, strictly necessary, but it helps this explanation, okay? So assume you have converted everything into negative normal form, and then you apply recursively the Morgan rules. I don't know whether you are familiar with the Morgan rules, but uh, is, uh, uh, is the rule which uh, uh, the Morgan rules are the rules which allow you to uh, invert uh, ends and ors. 
So when if you have a phi one and phi two or phi three, where such that phi one, phi two, phi three are themselves a more complicated form and then a formula, you can rewrite this as phi one or phi three and phi two or phi three. Okay, so you can so this with this and this with this. In general, if you have uh, uh, disjunctions of conjunctions, you can uh, uh, take all the possible combination of one element of every conjunction with all the other elements of the disjunction. So it's equivalent to do a sort of Cartesian product of all the elements. The bad news of this is that this is worst case exponential, okay? So, and the reason is that you can easily see that you duplicate. So notice that here you duplicate formula, okay? And uh, also, <coughs> sorry, um, the good news is that it preserves equivalence. So substantially, it has the very same amount of Boolean atoms and the, uh, the output form is equivalent to phi. This is one example of uh, validity preserving uh, uh, transformations, okay? So the input form and the output form are, are logically equivalent. Well, because, why? Because the substantial negative number form preserves equivalence and this transformation preserves equivalence, okay? Okay, so this is something that you may find in the books of logics, but uh, this is not used in practice because, of, because this is a very bad news. So the, the fact that this blows up exponentially is very bad news. So what if people use in say, instead is uh, uh, the labeling uh, synthesization conversion, also due, due to uh, citing, which is a famous logician. And substantially, this, this does something which we are used to do frequently in mathematics. So when we have an expression that occurs more than once, we give it a name. Okay, and we define this, we give it a name, so we define it. Okay, let's call this with this name. And then instead of the big expression, you use the name. Okay, so substantially what you do is, um, well, there are many different strategies to do this in synthesization and this, but that's, I explain the simplest possible. And uh, pretend we work bottom up on the logical structure of the formula. So take uh, a operate. So suppose you have a formula, and then you substitute. Again, uh, let's assume uh, that we have um, um, we reason bottom up. So let's pick uh, uh, a sub formula consisting in a, a couple of liters with the, some Boolean operators. Okay. Uh, or, uh, for instance, a literal one or literal, literal i and or literal j. So we substitute all instances of, of this subformula with a fresh Boolean atom. Fresh means which does not occur anymore. It didn't occur before in the formula. Okay? And so we, we, we say, okay, look, let's. Uh, call B this subformula, okay? We introduce this, this uh, definition, B if and only if Li or Lj, okay? And then we substitute, uh, we conjoin this, uh, uh, this definition and we substitute. Now that we, not, now that we have defined B as this uh, expression, we can substitute all instances of this some formula with B, okay? But then, uh, and the same with and, the same with enough relief, uh, well, the same of course with also with implication, but we can see an implication as a subcase uh, of, of, of all, right? Okay, so if we do that bottom up, okay, bottom up from uh, the, the, then this, uh, this sum formula is substituted with a, a Boolean atom. So if the curl negatively now becomes a litera, which will be part again of some expression in this form. So we do that, this transformation bottom up, and uh, we'd end up at the very end, we end up having one 
the, even the, the top level form is substituted with the Boolean atom, B. And then we have a long list of definitions of fresh Boolean atoms. Okay. But the fresh Boolean atom, so, but, but now this, uh, well, these are not in CNF, but this can be CNFized by applying the Morgan rule because this is small. Okay. In fact, all those instances here, all those CNFs here are very small and they are represented in this table. This is just applying the Morgan rule to this uh, very, very small formula because these are literals, okay? So this corresponds to three clauses in the case of ants and or and four clauses uh, in the case of an if and or if, okay? So at the end of the day, we end up having one Boolean atom, okay? And uh, a long list of uh, definitions of fresh Boolean atoms. Each definition needs uh, three or four clauses, okay? So we have at the end, the, the formula is in conjunctive normal form. And it's worst case linear, why? Because substantially it uh, uh, introduce one Boolean atom for every operator that you have eliminated from the formula. So introduce uh, three or four clauses every time you remove one Boolean operator in the formula, okay? So what's the, the uh, of this, the feature of this? Well, the good news is that worst case linear, okay? And, and that's for exactly for the reason I, I mentioned. This is three or four times bigger than the number of original Boolean, atoms, uh, Boolean operators. And uh, the atoms of the, of the output is a superset of the atoms of the original one because you introduce uh, some fresh Boolean atoms here, okay? And the result of the formula is that the, the outcome is equisatisfied with respect to phi. So this process allows you guarantees that the formula, the output form is satisfiable if and only if the, the, uh, the input formula was satisfiable. But the interesting part of that is also, in this case, uh, that uh, every truth assignment, from a truth assignment of the output, you can build a truth assignment of the input by simply dropping the, the truth values of the Bs, of the fresh variables, okay? Is it clear to everybody? Okay, this is exactly what SAT solver use in practice, possibly with some var variations, but that's the main idea. So you don't need an exponential blow up. What you pay is having more variables, but, okay, so let me show you an example here. Uh, okay, if you have this formula here, which is a complicated end of the bore or different on leaves, uh, blah, blah, you build the bottom up. So for instance, you take this OR formula here, which is uh, a, not a three or a one, you call it B1. Okay, and uh, this is this, so you add the definition B1 if and only if not a three or a one. This and OR, this will be they consist into, into three clauses like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Notice that this is the implication. So consider this the right implication. This is not B or LI or LJ, the right implication. The left implication, okay, is uh, uh, um, B is implied by LI or and J, which is the same as saying that B uh, is implied by Li and B is implied by Lj. Okay. Okay. So now you define a B2. So you take a five and not a three and uh, call it B2. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, so you, once you have defined the first layer here, then you can, for instance, you can, so for instance, the very last year, B8 is, a, is the definition of a, a, a one or not a four. 
Now that you have defined that the, you have substituted all those sub formula with B1, B2, B3, blah, blah. You can now you have a here that you have a if and only if B1, so you have here B1 if and only if B2, okay? In the substitution. Okay, so let's call this B9, okay? So you are the B9 if and only if B1 if and only if B2. Okay. Yep. And so on and so forth. You have another layer of definitions until you have, say, for instance, B12 is B7 and B8. And then you, you call B13 as uh, B9 and B10 or B10. You, you define a B14 as uh, a B11 and, uh, or B12. And at the very end, you define B15 as the, the end of B13 and B14. At the very end of the story, you have substituted the, all the formula with B15. Mm -hmm. Okay? So remember that then you transform each of these definitions into three or four clauses. And you have a CNF formula. Okay? Are we there? Yes. Yeah, uh, so they cannot yeah. be equivalent because we have more symbols, right? It's not equivalent because you have more symbols. Uh, but notice that substantially okay. the, the Bs uh, are just names for the more complicated values, for the more complicated expressions, right? So here, B1 okay, okay. Uh, is just a new name for not a 3 uh, or, a, or a 1. And similarly, say B9 is a, a, a new name for a, a, not a 3 or a 1, if and only if a 5 or a, not a 4. Okay? Okay. Notice also another fact that the value of the Bs is a deterministic consequence of the values of the As. You see this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. So, and this is, so once you assign the value of the, all the A's, then the value of the B derives deterministically from those definitions, mm -hmm. from a chain okay. of definitions. So, okay, so, so just, just let me conclude and then I, I, so the key point is that you don't really enlarge the, well, you say, well, I, you had the new, new variable, so you enlarge the search space. No, you don't enlarge the search space because the value of the Bs is a deterministic consequence of the values of the As. So the search space remains the same, is the two to n where n was number of A variables, okay? All the other are just named, derived, the value uh, is a deterministic consequence of, uh, of the values of the Bs. Is it clear? Yeah, yes. Thanks. There was somebody who was asking something. No? Okay. Okay, so far. Yes, Chun, yeah. Switch on the mic. Uh, as you said, the value of all Bs are determined by the value of As. Yes. So it looks looks like um, the original formula and the converted formula, they could be equivalent. But your point is, if I understand correctly, they are actually not. Is that oh, true? they're not equivalent because, um, for instance, okay, so consider, uh, blah, blah, blah. well, this, this transformation here, is not equivalent per serving, okay? Because uh, uh, the original formula does not depend on B, okay? So the original formula, once you verify the, the value of uh, the value on A, you could have indifferently the value of A, the B to true or B false. Okay. Remember, when you consider equivalence of formula, you are considering equivalence within the very same, um, the very same amount of Boolean variables. Okay. If if a Boolean variable does not occur in a formula, this means that that value of the formula is indifferent. 
okay? Here, in, a, in a, the resulting formula, the, the value of the B is not indifferent. You have only one value. For every truth assignment of the A's, you have only one value of the B's. Okay? Well, in principle, you could have two if the, the value of the sub formula is indifferent, okay? But substantially, uh, is, well, notice that, let me go back to the def very definition of uh, equisatisfiability. Do you realize that this is exactly the, the very same thing that we've done? So, uh, so here is very similar, right? So we have uh, some way uh, written, uh, add a fresh new variable here. Okay, so obviously, so A1 or A2 does not depend on A3. Okay, so it's once you, you make A1 and A2 satisfy A1 or A2, then A3 is indifferent. But for this, A3 is not indifferent. So you should not pick the wrong A3. So if I pick the wrong A3, well, in this case, A3 is indifferent, right? So I can pick whatever value of A3 I want. But in this case, in order to if I want A1 to be false and A2 to be true, I must impose A3 to be, to be false. Okay? Uh, okay, so now the, I understand. The point is that uh, you have, uh, um, when you have, you add the fresh new variables, okay? Implicitly, in the, in the original, if you consider the original formula in the, in the extended domain of variables, then both all the values of the fresh new variables work, which is not the case on the second case of the encoded formula. This is the reason why they preserve satisfiability, but they not preserve validity. Okay, are we there? Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for the question. Okay, so where are we? Uh, okay. Um, there is a slight variant. So there are, as I said, there are variants of this encoding. And one is exploiting polarity. We'll use uh, the notion of polarity several times. So in uh, um, the key point is that if the formula we are going to substitute occurs only positively in the formula, we need only a right implication. So we don't need the if and only if here. Well, we need only the right implication. Okay? Because this could occur, so if this occurs only positively, this is, uh, uh, its role uh, is, uh, is uh, can only be positive. So the point is, the relevant part is whether B is true. Okay? So if B is true, then L1 or L is true. Vice versa, if B occurs only negatively, then we use the, the other implications. If uh, this formula occurs both negative or positively, then you, use both, you still use the by implication. Okay? Um, let me go back to the example that I made before, okay? And you see that this is exactly this case, right? So if uh, I, um, in this case here, okay, A1 and A2 occur positively in the formula, okay? So I call a, well, this is a very stupid example, of course, a very trivial example, of course, but I introduce a fresh new variable, A3, and I say, look, I decide, um, I, uh, I substitute uh, um, a, a, A1 with A3 in my formula, and I, since A3, A1 occurs positively, I add the implication A3 implies A1. Notice that this is a left implication, right? A3 implies A1. 
Okay. Notice that the result is that those two are equisatisfiable. Well, of course, in this case, you had no, no reason to do that. But if you assume that A1 and A2 were bigger formula, not simply Boolean atoms, then this would make sense, right? And this would be exactly what, what, what we have done now. Exploiting the fact that A1 occurs only positively, I call it A3. So pretend for one second that these are not A1, A2, but phi1, phi2. So arbitrary complex formula, okay? I introduce a fresh Boolean atom, A3, okay, as a name for A1. This occurs positively. So I substitute phi1, let's go with A3, and then I define that A3 implies A1. You see that this, the results are, are equivalent, they are equisatisfiable, okay? Because you don't need the other, the other direction. What is the consequence of that? So why we are doing that, this is, what is the benefit of doing that? Well, of course, the result is smaller because the implication, the implication of uh, an OR is only one clause. The implication of an AND is two clauses. So rather than having three clauses here, you have one. Rather than having three clauses here, you have two. When you, are, when you have an if and only if, rather than the four clauses, you have only two, depending on the direction you are doing. So you, you end up having a smaller formula. Um, there is a drawback of that, okay? Um, a slight drawback. So not only, so this is uh, uh, advantages. Uh, so it's more, many such solver use that in particular when you have a bigger form, yeah? But it's not always the case that it's convenient to do that in particular with a small and very hard formula. And the reason is that one of the, of the benefit of having the, the by implication, uh, I wanted to look here. When you have a, a the, the benefit, of, one benefit of having the by implication is that your implication also work in the left direction. So when, for instance, here you assign Li to be true, okay, then automatically you can infer that B is true. Or when you have then uh, uh, both are false here, then you can infer that B is false. So if you remove the, the left implication, you don't have this deterministic step you can do. So is a uh, pros and cons of, uh, of uh, the by implication uh, labeling conversion with respect to a single implication uh, labeling conversion, okay? The, the many, the significant difference is that uh, you have, uh, uh, you lose uh, the necessity of doing left and right implications, okay? So producing a smaller number of, uh, of clauses, which is important when you have a really big formula. Sometimes in SAT, uh, when you do SAT encodings, you end up with really huge formula. So, and in this case, this is important to do something like that. Oh, sorry, can I ask uh, just sure. to, uh, so the drawback of this procedure is that we are losing the non-determinism, right? No, if well, okay. um, the, the difference between, okay, from uh, the, the basic uh, uh, synthesization, so th from the synthesization which use by implication, this one, Mm -hmm. so without exploiting the polarity. And the, what I call the improved version, the one which exploits polarity and thus uses only one implication. Okay. Okay. The, the benefit of the second with respect to the former is that uh, it produces smaller formula. Mm -hmm. Okay. For, for exactly for the, this reason. Okay. Because an implication as a as smaller encoding than uh, the by implication, okay? Right. The, the benefit of the, of the former with respect to the, to the, uh, the latter is that you lose left implications. Uh, 
so in the left implication, when, uh, for instance, the right element is true, okay, you can infer that the former is true as well. So you propagate, you allow to propagate Boolean atoms through, through okay. the, the formula. Okay? Okay. If, uh, if you have this, you lose this information. So from this encoding, if you know that Li or Lj is, um, Li or Aj is uh, true, you cannot infer from this that B is true. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you may see that B is indifferent, right? So you can different apply B and uh, uh, B to true or false in this case, right? But you, the solver doesn't know it. So you may find that uh, more eventually. Okay. See when we yeah. speak of algorithm, that is very important. One a very important fact of every search solver so every solver which is doing search is that uh, the solver should be able to do, to realize that he has deterministic steps. So, so a solver should always do deterministic steps as soon as possible. There is a general rule of thumb in a search. Do deterministic steps first and postpone choices, non-deterministic choice as much as possible. Okay, this is mm -hmm. a general universal uh, rule, strategy rule uh, of all search engines. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, have I answered you? Yeah, I, actually, I maybe I, I questioned the, the the wrong thing because I wanted to say losing determinism and I asked for non determinism. So sorry for the miscomprehension. No, 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 I mean, but, but that's clear. So I mean, thank you for the question because allow me to explain. So losing the, the left implication here can be a problem, can be worse than your search. Okay, yep. in general, there is always a trade-off in search by, from size and, uh, and uh, information. You may add a new clauses, a new formula which allow you to perform automatically some uh, deterministic inference, but then you, there is an overhead by handling those clauses, okay? There is a, uh, always a trade-off between number of clauses, so overhead to handle them, and the information that you can exploit uh, all those clauses, which you can exploit in search. We see that when we will see CCL sub solvers. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, uh, well, again, um, notice, well, be again, in doing this, beware of by implications. Beware of by implications, meaning that everything which is in the scope of a by implication has double polarity. And if there's double polarity, you have to use uh, by, Okay, that you have to do both the left and right. So it means that you have to do if and only if. Okay. So uh, for instance, consider this case here. Uh, notice that I have put some by implications here. Okay, look uh, to uh, this formula here. Okay, so you define all this uh, B1 as A3 and uh, not A3 and A1. But now you need by implications here. Why? Here you need by implication because this is under the scope of a by implication. So this sub formula here occurs both positively and negatively. Okay. So all the subtree is included. All the subtree below this point have to be converted as an if and only if. You have to use if and only if. Okay. So also the definition of B2, you have to define B2 as A5 or, so if and only B2, if and only if A5 or not A4. And of course, this is, has to be defined as an infinite. 
Look now instead at B8 here. B8 here is not under the scope of non eternal if. So this one occurs only positively, right? So you can define this using a mere simple implication. B8 if and only implies A1 or not A4. And similarly, B12, where is it? Implies B7 and not B8. Okay? Is this clear? Yes. Everything which is, well, is simply due to the fact, this is simply due to the fact that if uh, something occurs, you can apply this when uh, the subformula occurs positively. You can apply this when uh, the subformula occurs negatively. But if it occurs with both polarity, you have to do both, which is equivalent to write if and only if, right? Okay. Are we there? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, we can do better than this. So this is the basic idea, and then there are a lot of improvements uh, to, to this. So a few, a few intuition of what could, you could do better than this. The first part is that if uh, you have uh, a formula which is a, con so you, if you want to apply uh, so the encoding, uh, the citing encoding of, to a conjunction. And if one of the two forms is already in conjunction on the form, okay, you should not apply the labeling also to this form if this is already in conjunction on the form, right? So you just applied it to the first part, which is not in conjunction on the form. So substantially, you apply the labeling only to the part with, which needs to be signified, of course. Okay? I think this is quite obvious, right? Another fact is that sometimes for formulas which are already, they're not really in conjunctive normal form, but they are not too far from being conjunctive normal form, huh? it's convenient to just apply the standard, uh, the Morgan rules. Okay, if this, right, the Morgan rules does not cause a blow up, uh, it's, you can safely apply that. So for instance, if you are encoding something which is a complicated formula and something which is simply A1 implies B and C, this is simply, can be simply written as uh, not A or B and not A or C. Okay, because this is simply an implication. This is the same as A implies um, B and A implies C. And this is trivial, right? So you don't need to lay, introduce further labeling. You don't have to introduce a further renaming of this variable, blah, 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 blah. This is useless. So there are heuristics which realize, depending on the structure of the formula, if it's convenient to apply labeling or not. Another factor that you can exploit associativity. So if you have uh, uh, a associative list of A1 or A2 or A3 or and you don't need to label this and then to label this and then to label this, okay? You can simply label all the or the enary or or the enary and of a row. So you label the the wall conjunction of the wall disjunction. Okay, so you apply CNF for this. This is in general uh, involves uh, uh, K. So if you have a disjunction or conjunction of K um, elements, this uh, is uh, uh, K um, binary clauses and uh, uh, one uh, K plus one uh, clause to, to explore the other direction. Okay, another important fact uh, is typically uh, before applying the synthesization, one typical practice is to try to make, uh, to, to rewrite the whole formula into a compact, uh, into one form which uh, builds, uh, uh, which uh, um, uh, builds a very compact DAG. 
okay? Like uh, RBC, Andy Vertex graphs, uh, or and others, right? In such a way, if you share a lot, uh, well, remember by the encoding, okay, that uh, you encode uh, all instances of the same formula as B, okay? So if you have more than one instance, you don't, you need introducing only one variable. If you have multiple instances of the same sub formula, you need, you need introduction, you need only one variable and you need introduction this definition only once, okay? So the more you share the sub terms in a formula, the more compact is your final CNF encoding, okay? Is it clear? Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh, I think uh, it's all for today. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I see you tomorrow, 9.15. Okay. I ask you to be connected five minutes earlier. Okay. 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 Everything is fine okay. with that? Right. Okay. okay, thanks a lot yep. to everybody. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. bye.